Hey, hello, everybody. Welcome to episode 16. That's right. Even three hands are not enough anymore of the mechanics of poetry, where we try to get down to the nuts and bolts of poems themselves, the things that make up poems. And that's kind of today's topic. Today's question is, what are your favorite literary devices? And uh, a little bird told me that alighted on my windowsill, as Kaloki was just imitating. Uh, told me we should uh, put up a list first. So I'm gonna I'm gonna snap my fingers and a list will magically appear. Watch this, everybody. Here we go. Where did the list go? There it is. All right. So these are the top twenty right here. I'm sure you'll see your favorite if you know anything about literary devices is definitely in here. There are many more as well. And uh, I'm opening up now to everybody if they just want to say something about literary devices in general, and then we'll get down to our individual favorites. Uh, so who would like to talk about literary devices first? Well, I will say something. My question when I come into this is, what's not a literary device? In the poem, a poem itself is a literary device. Um, and as you just said, Don, this is a list, but far from a complete one. Um, we've seen other lists that include things like stream of consciousness as a literary device. This is certainly true, but it's not on this list. Um, I suppose you would, could think of it as something that you're using to um, put special emphasis of one kind or another on what you're trying to say, something that you wouldn't necessarily use in conversation, although that's not entirely true, but something that definitely provides one kind of emphasis. Um, a very simple one um, that I use a lot is repetition, refrain, or um, anaphora, the uh hey that didn't make the top 20 oh no there it is it's number 18 it, it made the list yeah yeah All okay right. the i guess there's a you know what is a literary device is again something that you use to make a particular evident and generally it's sustained uh in conversation, you're not likely to do repetition after repetition after repetition unless you're um, Martin Luther King. And oration is a different kind of um, poetry, I guess we would say. But uh, look at this list. It's a very powerful set of tools by which we enhance what we're trying to get across or um, can actually bring to light something that doesn't work so well or doesn't come across so well in just plain everyday use of words in the denotational use of words um, or prose as we want to say yeah there's Anybody a lot of poetics in prose James. good prose has poetics yeah Thank All right. Anyone answer. else want to say something, James? Um, yeah, I think it's important that to, when we think about literary devices um, is how we use them to communicate with our audience. And the more we understand what's out there, the more we can control and manipulate the language to um, make an impact with our words. And uh, some, some of those ways maybe things like assonance, right? Where you're playing with, with the sound of words um, or it may be uh, uh, meanings like hyperbole or puns where, you know, you're, you're, there's a baseline understanding of uh, certain context and then breaking that, um, you know, comedians do that a lot. Um, and sometimes people that write poetry that is fun and funny, um, use it as well and so there's 
uh, all these tools in our toolbox to use for, for different purposes, um, you know, like a hammer and a wrench and a screwdriver um, could, that we use to build out poems that, uh, that can reach people. So I think it's an important that um, e even though we probably use some of these in, in everyday speech and conversations, um, that if we're trying to build, you know, this, construct this poem um, and, and do it beautifully, that uh, we work on these, these tools and, and get skilled with them. Very good, sir. Well stated. Uh, Keloki, did you want to say something? Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, my, uh, I, uh, I, I like to use the refrain, especially in the call and response way, where, you know, uh, uh, well, you know, hip hop singers do that, you know, is a way of uh, where uh, the audience is not a witness to your point, but the participant. I think it's very important. Wow, where'd you get that idea? <laughs> yeah. Cool. Yeah, it, right. uh, uh, I know your your refrain was on. I think it was at the bottom of that list. Yeah, it uh, yeah, and uh, it's a part I I'm going to be uh, reading for my one. The, the old uh, the old the dirt. All right. Well, let's get into that now. Let's do that now. Let's get to the good stuff. Okay, now, uh, can you, uh, are you going to put these all day, uh, or do we do, I uh, just read it here? You can screen share. We can take this off the screen and put your poem on. Yeah. Okay, I'll put the old to dirt from my, uh, from my chat book, uh, <laughs> Indian Nation, which I, uh, <laughs> Free advertising. I suddenly realized what <laughs> he's so clever. <laughs> okay. Right. Uh, I'll dig it up. Uh, Give me a minute. That's pretty handy, actually, because we just used it last week. Yes, exactly. And uh, uh, ah. I think the poetry police are calling you, Keloki. No, it's not. It's uh, uh, I get uh, um, illegal use of. Uh, I try. If I slide it, they'll answer. I don't want to answer. Okay, it's off. Okay. Uh, that gave me time to find it. I've got it. I'm about to put it on the screen in just a few seconds. And uh, I, I, I uh, well, while you're doing it, I, at the last slide, it's it, the one you're afraid is "Oh my soul," and uh, and I want everybody here to say "Oh, oh a." Uh, to repeat, oh, my soul, like we did the last time. Is that the one that I missed? Yeah, okay. it's the first one right there. Hey, it looks like we can fit the whole poem. There's the whole poem. Awesome. OK. <laughs> OK. Oh, to dearth. Blessed be millions of biodiverse, biodegradable, microorganisms in a handful of dirt, oh my soul. Blessed be each shovel of dirt, which holds more living things than all the human beings ever born in our world, oh, oh my, my soul. soul. Blessed be the topsoil, the skin of the earth, the face of our mother, oh um, my soul. soul. Blessed be the sacred ground under our feet, the earth from which we come, and the earth to which we return, oh, my uh, soul. soul. Blessed be crowds of global villages, wherever mm -hmm. children dance and ring, stop, stoop, scoop, handfuls of dirt, fleeing the skies and get charred by laughing clouds of dust, oh, oh my, my soul. soul. Blessed be the dirt which grows corn and torn tortillas, rice portions on porcelain plate, frijoles covered with melted jack cheese, avocados eat jalapenos in guacamole, and limes squeezed in frosted margaritas. Oh, my soul. Drink to the life I feel within the land, 
the mountain I am, the tree I am, the river I am, the soil which is my flesh, oh my soul. Peace. Well, in that last stanza, you have another literary device. Repeating at the ends of lines. The what? I am, the tree I am, the river oh. I am. Oh. What device is that where you repeat at the end of the line? Hmm. Oh. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It was on that obscure list. Uh, what about the blessed bees? I have, it's, I, it's not a refrain, but I use the blessed bee for everyone. Oh, at the beginning, yeah. That's an afro. Yeah. Oh, okay. Three literary devices. Yeah, that's what I was one trying to... I didn't know I'd use. <laughs> we, got we got a list here. We'll dig it up. Oh, sorry for the pun. Dig. It was in your palm. Okay. The dirt, you know, dig. Oh, my God. <laughs> Let's see. Uh, I guess to switch, I have to go off a of share to bring up the other page. Yeah. Okay, so this is the list that Kaluki and I were looking at before the show. And uh, they asked the they answered the question, what is a literary device? <laughs> but did they really answer it? No. Mm. Think about it this way. I'm getting bored just reading the explanation. Uh, whoa, was that literary devices there? Okay. <laughs> All right, here's that list. So uh, that was the first one. That's simple repetition, epizusis. Anybody ever heard of that one? No. I've never heard of that one until half an hour ago, epizusis. Simple repetition, holy, holy, holy. And then the one at the beginning, anaphora. Epistrophe. Is that the one at the end? That's the one you did, Kelloki. Epistrophe. Okay. Or epistrophe. I never know how to pronounce these things. But that's the one you did. Okay. So you can be an, an erudite poet. Yes. Uh, the epistrophe in my final stanza was intentional. Oh, my God. Am I, am I a triple threat? <laughs> yes, yes. Triple. You did a triple apostrophe. It's like in the Olympics. They should have the Poetry Olympics. And <laughs> yeah, look, you will not execute a triple apostrophe. Here he goes. <laughs> now that I would like to see the Poetry Olympics. Uh huh. All right. Now she's going to attempt the first ever quadruple apostrophe. So you see, it just goes on, just like gymnastics, same thing. You know? Yeah. So what the human can stand. Did Chris, you know? it's your turn. Okay. Unless Kelki had one more thing to say. No, to no, no, not the drill. But... Okay, pay no attention to the man in the background. Yeah, the man with the beard. Yeah. Okay, go ahead, Chris. You may choose your weapon. Of yeah. Weapon. Well... Where did it go? Um, the one I'm going to talk about a little more is an ephra, um, because I find they use it a lot. But first, I want to share probably the most famous use of an ephra in Do modern it. poetry, at least. Um, Robert Frost stopping by the woods. Can you see that? It's a little bit small. A little bit small. A little bigger. I can read it, but I can read just about anything. That better? That's better. Okay, go ahead, sir. Okay. Whose woods I know, I think. Whose woods these are, I think I know. His house is in the village, though. He will not see me stopping here to watch his woods fill up with snow. My little horse must think it queer to stop without a farmhouse near. Between the woods and frozen lake, the darkest evening of the year, 
He gives his harness bells a shake to ask if there is some mistake. The only other sounds, the sweep of easy wind and downy flake. The woods are lovely, dark and deep, but I have promises to keep and miles to go before I sleep and miles to go before I sleep. The repetition of the last line is incredibly powerful. It leaves a very strong image and very much emphasizes um, the concerns the, where the uh, protagonist is in life. It states a thought, it states it again as if he's ruminating on it. You can picture somebody saying something and miles ago, boy, I sleep and think about it some more and think, yeah, and miles to go before I sleep. Boy, is that true. Um, there, this is used, this anaphora um, is used often in poetry, often in my poetry, and seldom thinking about it. Like many literary devices, poets find, um, you don't say, I'm going to use an anaphora here. Um, uh -huh. You do it. Um, you may be consciously say, I'm going to rhyme. For the most part, if you're into rhyming, the rhyme just happens. The same thing with many, many of these literary devices. Um, I forget the name for it, but. Um, telling us his horse's thoughts is a literary device. Um, Personification? Hmm? Personification? Personification, yeah. Um, I'll take literary devices for 200, please. Hmm? The one- oh, I was playing literary Jeopardy, I'm sorry, man. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Okay. The, uh, yes, I recognized or heard of that uh, as a literary device before, and I always just called it the talking dog device. Um, That's a good one. Yeah, and common. I ran across, came across this in my own poetry or had brought to my attention. Let me bring this up. Um, oh, while well, I'm getting these together, um, remind you that Robert Frost says those last two lines were an accident, that he had this poem almost ready to go and he was under pressure from his uh, publisher to get him something. So wow. he said, essentially, what the heck, I'll just repeat the last line and gave it to the publisher. And uh, so that was a, a, an unthought out uh, literary device. Very serendipitous. Yes, uh, I suppose serendipity is a kind of literary device too. I don't know, in creation. Yeah, some literary yeah. devices are visual, some are more cerebral, yeah. Some are both. Yeah. Yeah. Here we go. Did you want to share that other poem? Yeah, I was hoping. Yeah, I've got it. Um, and you'll see where I've used repetition. Um, okay. Pretty straightforwardly a couple of times, pretty less straightforwardly at other times. And I've had people question whether this was appropriate or not. So let me read it to you. What's needful? I don't, I don't need no eye exam. I'm looking at your poem. And you, you got to make it a little bigger, a little bigger if you can. I was raised to do what I, I can't believe I can read it. <laughs> ah. Yeah. Your what? glasses still work. Yeah. I know. That better? Uh, so we bit better. We bit better. We usually use the Kaloki test. If he can read it, anybody can read it. The Kaloki yeah. is deeply engrossed in a well, I have it right close to me in a glass song. Does that work? Well, what do you think, James? Are good enough? Yeah. Okay. James. Let's go. Let's go with it, Chris. Okay. Um, I can go and click more. If you don't need the title anymore, then uh, we can still see the whole poem. Okay. 
I was raised to do what's needful. I was raised to haul the water and heat it on the wood stove to wash dishes or a shirt, but I'm happy not to. Hot running water on tap, I never take for granted now. Every day I have it, I'm grateful. I'm used to being alone. I'm used to empty rooms and dusty days, content with the making of things and the thinking of thoughts. But sometimes I miss the clink of a glass I'm not holding, a sigh, a sneeze, a whispered, oh my God, at something you see in the paper. The tiny buzz I get when I come in and something's not the same. You've adios the empties or dog stretched out a Kimbo on the couch. I'm a quiet man, but there is empty quiet and there is full quiet. There is me quiet and there is us quiet. Wood stoves and hot running water. I can do the one as well as the other, but I'm not happy not to. And you can see. Wow, that's, that is a delightful poem. The uh, repetitions, the anaphoras, easy to spot. I was raised, I was raised, I'm used, I'm used, but also at more distance, but I'm happy not to. Or I'm grateful. Um, the next to the last stanza is full of repetitions, although they're not exact repetitions, but they're performing the same sort of uh, function of emphasis in the case of this penultimate stanza, uh, increasing emphasis. Um, quiet, 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 quiet. Uh, and helping to compare, have that strong in your mind while you're, I give you the comparison again between the old way and the new way. Um, I have very good news, Chris, very good news. What you just described is on the obscure literary device list. Oh, good. There is a word for it. It's a very obscure word. I want to bring it up in just a moment. But first I want to say oxymoron. Any oxymorons in that penultimate stanza? Um, Any of those quiets uh, an oxymoron? Full quiet, is that an oxymoron? You could look at it that way, except that um, we're talking about not the characteristics of the quiet so much as the conditions of the quiet. Um, the yes. quiet that happens when it's just me, the quiet that happens when it's us. Um, the empty quiet, the quiet that's occasioned by nobody else around, uh, and the full quiet. Um, yeah. I love the me I quiet could, and the us quiet. Those are fantastic. Yeah. But right. now you mentioned full <laughs> quiet, maybe it'll be an oxymoron. It certainly has that characteristic because I'm talking about the quiet where a glass is clinking and um, my girlfriend is coughing and you no know, quiet with sounds and it makes a difference to how uh, I the author feel about the quiet a silent quiet is not nearly as fun as a full quiet okay I'm going to find I'm going to find what you did man I'm going to blame you yeah <laughs> okay No, you didn't do that one. That's a famous one, uh, except nobody knows how to pronounce it. Uh, anadiplosis. <laughs> <laughs> anadiplosis, that's where yeah. you uh, you end with a word and then you begin with it in the next line. You ever written a poem that way? I've done that. Uh, I wrote an ode to aluminum. Maybe I'll share it later. Ode to uh. aluminum. Uh, where I used anadiplosis and I didn't even know it. Okay, but I'm still <laughs> looking for yours. I'll find it. This is a short list. Because uh, we just finished reading this before the episode, and you just demonstrated it. Uh, repetition of the root word is that the one? High placed, 
I paid official mm, battle and battle. That's using different forms of the root. That's not quite it. Uh, parallel structure, no. Reverse. Uh, that, that's that mirror effect when you repeat, but you reverse it. It's mm. not that either. Catastrophe. Oh, I like the word chiasmus. That's the Yoda one, yeah. Yes. Poly syndeton, extra conjunctions, no conjunctions, uh, understatement. Okay. No, it's not here. What? Oh. What, 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 what? Is there a. I thought it was here. Is there a formal That's Greek right. name for no articles, which seem to be very common in 20th century poetry? Yeah, you're, that's one of the things I always tell people if you have articles, see if you can lose them, right? Yeah, in poetry, so you get to the root words, nouns and verbs. Uh, okay, well, I didn't find it, but I, it's got to be something. It's a, it's a relative of the oxymoron, because you're, you're juxtaposing very interesting contrast going on when you say us quiet, me quiet. That's just fascinating. I really love it a lot. Thank you so much, Chris. But I got to give equal time to that patient man, Mr. James Coates, who has just been very calmly ready to drop the bombs of words on us. Go ahead, James. Hey. Um, so yeah, I, it again, literary devices, um, the more you know, the more you can use. And um, I often blend um, a variety in my poems. Um, instead of, I may start with like one specific where it's like, I wanna use this one in the poem. Um, but then because of the way um, poetry and language works, other stuff finds its way in there, um, even without you necessarily planning or sometimes even noticing. And so um, I want to talk about uh, extended metaphor. And um, uh, that is, we know metaphor, right, is, um, you know, a, a comparison. Um, and a simile uses like or as, so it doesn't use uh, um, like or as to do that, to do the comparison. Um, but the extended metaphor uses the same metaphor throughout the whole piece. Uh, and, and that's going to kind of be challenging sometimes. But I love when, um, when poets do it because um, they usually bring in all the different language and relate different um, terminology to that specific subject in a new way. And I find that really interesting. Uh, and then on top of that, um, imagery uh, is really big for me and being able to, to paint a picture for people. Metaphor does that well, but me particularly, I like to use um, sensory imagery. So, you know, touch, taste, smell, like the five senses. Um, and then sensual imagery which uses like um, uh, response to the body and, um, uh, and the, the feeling of the body and stuff. Um, and again, the sense. You no, know, James, I just looked up extended metaphor because I remember back in the 20th century, I was told that was called conceit. Have you heard of that? Mm, I heard of the word. Oh yeah, good. Uh, an extended metaphor, also known as a conceit or sustained metaphor. So, uh, do you want to read the definition for us? I just googled it. I can't show it because I have a background. But uh, <laughs> you, you author's can read exploitation. It. Yeah, I'm going to read it. An author's okay. exploitation of a single metaphor or analogy at length. It's what you said through multiple linked tenors, vehicles, and grounds throughout a poem or story. Boy, that's a literary device fest that sentence. <laughs> Uh, linked tenors, vehicles, and grounds. I've heard of vehicles. Grounds, though, that's a new one for me. Hmm. 
Uh, another way to think of extended metaphors is in terms of implications of a base metaphor, which is, I think, a fancy way of saying what you just said, that you you carry it on and use it in variations. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Have you got an example of that one? Yeah. Let me pull uh, it up. Really, that'll be the proof is the pudding, right? The poetry is the best part of this show, that's for sure. Go ahead. Okay, you can see that. I can read it, but I can read just about anything. <laughs> okay. What do you think, people? Can you read it? Can you read it? I can read it. Yeah. Okay. Um, so this particular poem, because of the title I chose being um, uh, associated with um, the little death, with a, a particular meaning. It, yeah. I feel like that's what makes the poem the, the metaphor. Um, initially, when I wrote it, I wrote it to be very um, uh, sensory and, and sensual um, about, um, about uh, well, I can talk about it after I read it. We'll reveal it after the poem. Yes. <laughs> Lapit Morty. It is late night and my willpower is waning. I need the comfort only you can deliver me. Give in to temptation, the smooth, dark chocolate and rich, complex sensations, a mouthwatering delight. Silky, velvet yearnings long to taste, confections, creamy folds bon dieu across the tongue. I inhale the perfect melange of heavenly decadence, intoxicating le dor delicious, arousing a hunger to devour. I've been eyeing you all day, waiting to get these hands on your luscious mound scoops of natural seduction. You taste even better than you look. One bite and I'm hooked, fiending for a drizzle from your milky morsels. I want you between my lips, that sweet vigor to feed my greed, swallow every last moist molecule, savor the essence of satisfaction. We, oui, tu es mon plaisir, melt as pure sugar in the flame of desire's everlasting heat, the flavor of soft secrets, eyes roll back like daylight savings, ecstasy, Bays in nerve endings. You will always be the sin worth dying for, the love I cannot betray. Ooh. <laughs> oh man, you really saved the best answer for last. That was spectacular. <laughs> really good, really good. Yeah, so um, so initially I want to write something that was um, uh, sensual uh, about this delicious piece of chocolate cake that I had is, um, <laughs> and, uh, and, and I thought it was so delicious. Uh, and, and, and so then that's where the title came in, comparing it to, to the ecstasy um, uh, of lovemaking. And, um, and so that, that's how the, the metaphor, if you look at it as, you know, relating to, um, intimacy with the partner, then uh, it has a different meaning. Um, then, then if you're just enjoying this, this you know, decadent uh, dessert. Uh, what does the French word mean? I like, uh, um, la adore. Uh, uh, Le odor delicious, that, that means uh, smells delicious. Oh, uh, odor, yeah, that's bon, right. Bon dire is, is like dance, like, um, like, uh, Kind of like um, I don't know if that's a ballet move, but it's it, but it's kind of like dance across. It's um, uh, related to the word bound, so it's kind of a jumping. Like a, yeah. Uh, and then uh, mon plaisir, it's just uh, pleasure. Yeah. I want to jump in too. I want to jump in too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Hey, did you go to the Ken Scott yeah. School of Metaphor? <laughs> you had. Uh, uh, you had, Using, uh, you had the word uh, scoops there, scoops that took me away from the cake, honestly. Yeah. 
scoops. Uh, it's more ice cream than cake, uh, but okay. <laughs> and uh, out, you did have a cliche in here. Mm -hmm. I, I look to the oldest people in the room, which is anybody but James. <laughs> and uh, if you've heard the term luscious mounds before, just raise your hand, okay. Okay, that, that one's a bit of a cliche. That's my oh, only wow. critique for an otherwise perfect poem. Now that term will get you on the bad side of uh, some critics, because mm -hmm. it's been heard before, but you can always twist it. But otherwise, wow, it just uh, that those last two stanzas for that matter, right? Pure sugar in the flame, desires everlasting heat, the flavor of soft secrets, I, soft secrets. Now that is not a cliche. <laughs> that is just the opposite of a cliche. That's fantastic. Uh, eyes roll back like daylight savings. <laughs> I got to get some money out because I would pay for that one. <laughs> Ecstasy bays and nerve endings. Uh, you'll always be the sin worth dying for, for the love I cannot betray. Oh, yeah. I salute your ending. Yeah. Um, uh, fabulous. So, yeah, that's, uh, you know, the, the, I feel like bringing, bringing the senses in it, you know, the, the taste and the you know, um, and that uh, point out that there is, is um, using the senses. Is there a term? Yes. Oh, using is the there senses. is yet another um, uh, literary device in there, and that's using foreign words and phrases. And there's a, a funny Greek name for that too, as I do remember. Um, and uh, which is different than doing a quote in a foreign language, using the language as a language, um, using the language, um, the connotations of that language, in this case, French, which is, has a lot of identification with lovemaking, among other things, <laughs> um, as an extension of uh, what you're trying to say. It adds a new layer, a new depth to what you're going to say. Uh, I can also John, say that. Wait, wait um, a second. One minute, Kelly. One minute. Go ahead. Oh, sure. okay. That the other um, uh, two other things things about that is that one, it rather lightly uses single metaphor. They're mostly metaphors about taste and touch, as you said, the central metaphors. Mm -hmm. um, but the metaphor that was in your head eating chocolate cake is not explicit in the poem. Mm -hmm. now, if you change the title to chocolate cake, um, <laughs> that would really bring the metaphor out. Um, and right, hold, the, that thought, hold that thought, because I want to give Kelke a chance to say what he had to say before he forgets. Go ahead, uh, sir. Uh, you, you, know, you, uh, you asked the question, what is the literary term that calls, you know, uses all the senses of that, and I'd like to know what that uh, term is oh yeah i thought i heard you say i'm that. asking because i don't know if you're using oh there, it was not, oh okay okay i thought there was senses what is that a literary device hmm? uh, does, it have, does it have a name well uh, what, uh, what are some of the things we say we uh besides uh oh uh sensuous uh but uh, the way uh yeah i i just wonder if there's any other yeah. words express that type of he uses uh when I was taking the writing class that Cal stayed in here, uh, he's, uh, the guy said, very few people use the taste, you know, they use, you know, uh, as one of the senses. Yeah, sight is are, usually uh, number one, yeah. Sight smells, maybe, and, uh, which has to that, but the, the taste. Goes last. Yeah, but. Uh, well, they're saving the best for last, really. Yeah, as James Coates' poem is a perfect example of that. Yeah, okay, well, I'm gonna touch on uh, something sensual was my choice for a literary device. Is it my turn? Did you, you have your say, sir? Okay, uh, so I guess it's time for me to dinner. talk about it. All right, so uh, the one thing that uh, always intrigued me was this idea of synesthesia, the mixing of the senses. It's something that we do on our everyday speech when we say, hey, that's a cool shirt. 
Well, that's a temperature, cool is a temperature, but people lose that idea. It's so commonplace that people have lost the device. Cool is just cool, it's not a temperature, but that's what it is, right? If you say that's a hot dress, well, if you touch it, okay, what happens? Yeah. Uh, but in, in poetry, you can conscious, consciously juxtapose uh, different senses. Uh, for example, here's a way to look at it. Uh, you can hear with your eyes, right? You can say that's a loud color. That's a very loud orange, right? That's hearing with your eyes. And you can, uh, you can smell, I guess with your ears, you can smell with your ears because you can say uh, that was a pungent speech, right? So a stinky speech. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, those kind of devices I really enjoy. And I didn't really uh, have the time to research for an example. I was busy helping someone uh, refurbish a room of their house this morning because uh, it was they, they had converted their parlor into a kitchen. Hmm. And uh, one of the rumors in that house uh, reported it, I guess, out of revenge for being evicted. And then the, the city said, well, yeah, you got to take that second kitchen out. You can't have two kitchens in one house. That's against the rules. <laughs> so uh, all the plumbing was torn out and the cabinets and the refrigerator was moved to another room. And then you have to patch all those holes, right? Every kitchen has these holes in the walls because you have a refrigerator and a stove. Uh, and then you have to patch that up. Hmm. I helped move the furniture. I was there toward the end of the process. I helped move a, a table and a sofa in to make it look more like a parlor in the kitchen. This no. has got to pass inspection next week from the city that, to avoid that's an, lines. that's an extended metaphor if ever there was one can you make a poem out of that i'm gonna probably have to do that now thank you that's hey i'll make a note of that yeah the, the repair oh yeah but i will share a poem or two uh simply as my reactions to what you guys mentioned uh, first, I'm going to start with Kaloki. We have physical evidence of the birth of Kaloki's multi voiced poetry. Mm. Very inspiration for it. <laughs> I can show you now. <laughs> this, this originated back in the 20th century. For those of you who are alive back then, yeah, way back then. I'm just going to bring up the poem. I'll bring up the poem. It'll take me a moment. To... Yeah, it's got a title that's worth remembering. Let's see. Take a moment. Okay. Get the right list. Boom. Search for it so it's faster. Okay, going to it. There it is. And this is the easy eye edition. I don't know what that means. Oh, yeah, that's easy to read. Okay. Uh, screen share. This is the easy eye edition so that can be read from a distance. This is a poem that was inspired by a very uh, classic 20th century poem you might have heard of called The Love Song of J. Alfred Prufrock <laughs> by T.S. Eliot. And uh, back in 1996, we had a poet uh, from New York who was pretty much, was, I think she would have just arrived from New York a couple of years earlier, uh, back in 1994 to join California Poets in the Schools. She was in the New York Poets in the Schools program and her name 
is Adele Slaughter. Uh, I haven't talked to her in a while, so I'll try to find her on Facebook. But her assignment to us in the workshop, she visited our workshop as a guest poet, and she uh, had us read the love song of J. Alfred Prufrock, and we had to create a character, just like Prufrock is a character. So my character has a euphemism in the last name there, because I didn't want to use a bad word, so I said Joe Sphincter. And anybody who knows what a sphincter is can be in on the joke. And uh, so this guy is kind of a man of the streets, and at the very end of the poem, is the inspiration for Kelloki's entire ovure. No, no. <laughs> All right. Hey, bud, I want to tell you something. Hey, don't walk away. I've got something to say. So what if we're not from the same neighborhood? I see you every day when I stop at this 7-Eleven, and I wonder if you've noticed me driving through in my Nissan PU. Yes. I keep my rims so shiny. You can see yourself as I drive by. That's because I want you to notice I ain't no Weber. I know what it's like here. I stop, look around. People always in their own business, standing at the bus stop, leaning against the store or inside playing the games. I buy my breakfast burrito and OJ. I see you and I walk to my wheels and speed away through the intersection. But today I had to stop before I go into my work life. I had to stop because I wonder what the hell are you thinking when you see me stopping? I had to stop because I wonder what the hell is your life like tangent to mine? I'm just bugged going to work, not talking to anybody except sense to the clerk. It's like I'm driving through water so slow I can't hear nobody saying anything. I can't take it anymore. Punch me or something. Make me feel I belong in my world, in your world, in our busy to busy world. Why are we so wrapped up in our own lives? Why are we here? Just to pass each other every day, make us feel we're in a social ball, orbiting a vacuum that doesn't care if I die or you. Oh, sure, people will go to our funeral, especially if I pull out a gun and shoot your indifferent ass. Some guy would need here on the news will comment, we existed for two minutes. Lesson for us all, or to us all, lesson to us all. Hey, don't walk away. I don't have a gun. I just watch too much TV. How about you? You got a wife and a kid and a job and time to yourself in this world? Do you worry sometimes? Why are we here? We just end up replicating the, until the great forces eliminate all signs that we are here? Someday the sign will read, we were here, but there'll be nobody to read it. So what do we do now? We're standing here in front of a 7-Eleven with cars in the street and work to do. Are we really keeping the world running? Have you ever heard of J. Alfred Prufrock? Hey, what are you? A poet or something? Mm -hmm. and that was the birth. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, and Kaloki really took to it. Thank you, sir. Yeah, my my, my the poem of the day was another Spectre spinoff. <laughs> or Ooh. Spectre fail <laughs> spinoff. Well, yeah, it was pretty indulgent. I, I'm pretty satisfied right then. I'm pretty feeling pretty good right now. That poem had a lot of devices in it. I was fun to find pick the devices up. Yeah. Well, and, uh, don't, don't keep it secret. Tell us. And you and you read it just like you did, you know, when you first did it too. You know, came out. I tried. I tried. I tried. Yeah. Uh, you can get a free copy of this poem by going to the Poetry Superhighways famous list of featured poets broadsides. Uh, I think I'm around uh, 187, somewhere around there. I don't know. <laughs> he's just he's. At the Kowal Cafe, they've had hundreds of poets broadsided. Have you been broadsided by Rick Lippert? Mm -hmm. If you haven't, then you should, because all these poets here are worthy of broadsiding. Oh, yes. Oh, uh, yeah, excuse well, me. Here, I got to go here. My uh, my son just came back last night from Brooklyn. Yeah, Ethan. we're just that about wrapping up just the episode here. We've all had our say. So I, I, wanna, I was just about to thank Kel Loki. Oh, OK, OK. And uh, Chris, 
and James, who I can depend on so much. Uh, we've lost the ladies. So we'll have to figure a way to get them back, pick a topic, or I don't know. I, I hate to differentiate, but uh, mm. we'll figure out something. We'll figure out something. We'll just beseech people. Please, please um, uh -huh. join us, lonely men. Maybe you know, there are masculine know. topics and there are feminine topics. There are. Well, I thought this world was not binary anymore. I thought, uh, you know, we were getting closer to equality. Oh. Yeah, but poetry predates non-binary. Yeah, with masculine endings, feminine endings. Uh, that's another pair of literary devices. Yeah. Yeah. Well, on that happy note, thank you, everybody. This uh, video should be up in a couple hours. I'll notify everyone, and hopefully people enjoy this. Thank you again. And uh, oh, I'm going to stop the recording to make us thank free. You. In one, two.